Welcome everyone to this month's ISFE webinar entitled Introduction to the Rheology of Foods with Emphasis on Linear and Nonlinear Viscoelasticity and Their Application. This time by, <clears throat> sorry, by Dr. Joseph Cochini from Purdue University at the US. A brief introduction uh, of Dr. Cochini is that he's currently the School Endowed Chair in Food Processing in the Department of Food Science at Purdue uh, since 2013. In this university, he leads a research program in rheology, biophysical engineering, and the nanotechnology of foods. Before he was at Purdue, he was the Eugene Bingham Professor of Food Rheology at the, univers at the University of Illinois. And he came into this position from a distinguished professor position at Rutgers University. At the University of Illinois, he was also served, um, he also served as an associate dean of research and director of the Illinois Agricultural Experiment Station. At here also at Rutgers, he um, was department chair, associate director, and director of the Center of Advanced Food Technology. He is also the recipient of more than a dozen uh, awards, including the Nicholas Afford Award of the IFT, the Samuel K. Prescott Award of the IFT, the Scottler Award of AATC, the Harold Macy Award of the Institute of Food Technologies, Minnesota Division, the Marcel Lonsin Research Prize of IFT, the Carl Wilhelm Ravender Award of AATC, and also the Lifetime Achievement Award of the International Association for Engineering of Food. And food. He was elected fellow of IFT in 2000 and fellow of the International Union of Food Science and Technology in 2006. He has also received grants from the USDA, NSF, DOD, NASA, State uh, of New Jersey and State of Illinois and many industrial companies uh, for over 20 million dollars. He also has published over two, uh, sorry, 280 referred um, papers and book chapters. So um, today we have a very, very special guest. Um, so and I'm really happy and really thankful uh, for having him in here. So just a brief reminders before we start, remember to mute your microphone during the presentation and if you have any questions through it, you can write them or chat um, so that, that you can, you do not forget them and at the end you can select either to ask them directly to our speaker or I can also read them aloud for you. Thanks uh, so much, Dr. Pagini, for sharing your knowledge with us. And please. Thank you very much, Viridinia, for uh, the kind introduction. Uh, and I'm very thankful to the International Society of Food Engineering uh, for extending me this invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, give this uh, webinar. Uh, so today, uh, as Viridinia mentioned, I will talk about uh, uh, the rheology of foods with emphasis on linear and nonlinear uh, viscoelasticity uh, and their application to food quality and food processing. Um, so I think uh, it pays to quickly review why rheology is important. Uh, we cannot, in many cases, uh, design flow processes uh, without having good rheological data. Uh, rheological properties and measurements are also very important in quality control. Often making a rheological measurement uh, tells us whether the product is meeting specifications uh, and is of the right quality or not. Uh, during processing, uh, during uh, storage stability, I'm sorry, during storage, uh, the stability of the food is also reflected in its uh, rheological properties. Uh, and uh, texture is strongly related to uh, the rheology of foods. Uh, and finally, uh, the rheology is also uh, a, a mirror of the molecular structure and conformational changes uh, of food materials. So there is a lot that we can learn from rheology. Uh, and in there, uh, viscoelasticity uh, is a very important part of rheology. Uh, this is the domain where we're looking at materials that have both uh, 
viscous and elastic properties. Uh, and, uh, and now, you know, let's quickly take a look at a few things that happen uh, when materials have uh, some strong uh, uh, elasticity. So, uh, you know, the first and most common observation is that you have flow reversal uh, in the mixing of viscoelastic fluids. Uh, and uh, normally with Newtonian material, uh, materials uh, when as the, the streamlines are essentially going outward, uh, but with viscoelastic materials, they basically uh, are going inward uh, in order to be able to produce essentially this uh, road climbing phenomenon, otherwise known as the uh, Weissenberg effect. Uh, Newtonian materials don't do this. They only produce uh, uh, a parabolic profile on the surface. Uh, another, so this is essentially uh, materials that have different degrees of elasticity, uh, and you can see how uh, they display different degrees of road climbing. Uh, road climbing is also a function uh, of the rotation speed of the mixer. Uh, another very important uh, property uh, of viscoelastic material is essentially elastic recoil. Uh, this particular property can be observed in food materials. Uh, if you buy some uh, light syrups, uh, uh, materials that contain a lot of gums in order to uh, increase the viscosity, uh, when you stop making the material uh, flow from the bottle, uh, you see essentially the stream uh, pretty much uh, bouncing back and that's the, uh, that's the elastic recoil phenomenon. Uh, this is a very common property of uh, viscoelastic materials. So um, viscoelasticity uh, or rheology actually is measured, uh, is observed in many different kinds of flows. Uh, we are commonly, we are uh, used to employ shear flows uh, in many of our applications. Uh, but there are also very important extension flows like uniaxial uh, extension flows, planar extension flows, and biaxial extension flows, uh, and, then, and then volumetric flows. So for example, uh, in dough sheeting or calendaring, as some of you may know it, uh, if, the, uh, if the rotation speed of the two uh, calendars are the same, then essentially you're pulling uh, on the material in the same direction. Uh, and instead of uh, shearing it, uh, you are extending it to a large extent. And that could be a uniaxial extension or it could be a planar extension. Uh, in, another, in another very uh, important example, okay. Uh, biaxial extension is basically uh, the process of the formation of more area uh, during the deformation. And a classical example is bubble growth. So why do we call that biaxial extension? Uh, because you're creating more surface. And the only way to create more surface is to pull the material in two directions simultaneously. Uh, and, uh, and the sphere is a very good example. So you can see here, uh, you start essentially with a small bubble, uh, but as the bubble becomes larger, this, the surface area in this little uh, part of the sphere becomes much larger uh, in the larger sphere. So essentially this is the result of biaxial extension. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, a, a classical application of biaxial extension uh, is actually during baking, uh, where the small bubbles that are formed during proofing uh, now essentially grow under uh, the uh, effect of heat, which produces steam, and carbon dioxide, which is being released uh, uh, from leavening agents like yeast. Uh, and then you start with uh, uh, a relatively smaller volume. Uh, this picture exaggerates it a little bit just to make a point, but the point is that you start uh, with a, a smaller volume uh, than what you end up with, and that's the result of the bubbles that actually grow in the bread. Uh, 
So the way to simulate that in real life uh, is actually to take uh, a cylindrical shaped material uh, and you lubricate the two surfaces so that there is no contact between uh, the surfaces of the cylinder uh, and let's say the plate of a texture analyzer, uh, the TXT2, for example, uh, where you subject the material uh, to uh, a compression. Uh, and during that compression, uh, again, there is no contact between uh, the two ends. So the material essentially slips at those two ends because of the lubricant. And what you do is 100% uh, uh, increase the uh, surface area, therefore creating biaxial extension. Uh, so these are very important uh, uh, deformation processes that affect uh, uh, food processing, food quality. So moving on, uh, what do we do in uh, rheology? I mean, basically, uh, on one hand, it's a very simple science. And on the other hand, it can be very complicated because we're trying to analyze that simplicity uh, with a lot of very good math. But in uh, the first type of experiment, uh, we apply a stress and then we measure the deformation or deformation rate in shear or extension. Uh, so it's either about applying stress or applying deformation and then measuring deformation in the first uh, kind of experiment and measuring stress uh, in the second kind of experiment. Uh, and then we take the ratio uh, of stress to strain or strain to stress or stress to strain rate, and we obtain viscosities and moduli and so on and so forth. And we will discuss those uh, uh, in some detail as we proceed throughout this presentation. So uh, like I said, uh, uh, one of the most common uh, geometries to use for rheological measurements is simple shear flow. Uh, and here we simplify the geometry so that we can use some basic math to properly characterize it. Now, in this particular presentation, you will see uh, that I have uh, minimized uh, the amount of math uh, so that we can look at ideas and concepts uh, and we can try to figure out what goes on during rheological measurements. But in simple shear flow, uh, we have a plate which is stationary. Uh, and the fluid is basically between two plates, uh, but the upper plate uh, uh, is moving with a certain velocity V uh, under the uh, action of a shear force F. So then during this deformation, uh, the fluid basically moves differently in different layers. Uh, so in, at this point, for example, there is a small deformation, but as you keep uh, going higher, in the vertical direction that we will call y in this particular case, uh, the deformation actually increases. So in order not to have to characterize the deformation in each point, what we do is to recognize uh, that these are all similar triangles. Uh, and if I take the ratio of delta x to delta y, I get a constant. So that constant is actually called the strain or, uh, or shear strain because it's a shear deformation. Uh, and then uh, when we look at the time change of this particular strain, we actually get the strain rate or, she or shear rate. And uh, when we rearrange this ratio so that we can write it as uh, uh, the derivative of delta x over delta y, uh, by rearranging delta x, uh, we now can write this as the change in velocity in the x direction uh, relative to uh, the y direction. Uh, and we have a characterization of, uh, of shear rate. So now materials behave uh, quite differently uh, under uh, different applied shear rates. Uh, very simply, most of you may be very familiar with these ideas, uh, but if uh, when you uh, subject the material to increasing shear rate, uh, you get a linear increase in shear stress. You have a Newtonian material. Uh, water is an example of a Newtonian material. Uh, 
Uh, honey is an example of a Newtonian material. The important thing is that you get this straight line and the slope of this straight line is actually the viscosity. Now, many materials don't follow this simple behavior. Uh, as you apply an increasing shear rate, uh, the progressively increasing amount of shear stress actually decreases, and therefore it creates the impression uh, that the viscosity decreases as the shear rate increases. So these are called shear thinning materials and many food materials are shear thinning. Uh, and another more, and another fancier name for these uh, are uh, pseudoplastic materials. On the other hand, some materials actually may show uh, increasing uh, shear stress resistance as you apply shear rate. Uh, so now the flow curve rapidly increases uh, when you plot shear stress versus shear rate. Uh, and these are shear thickening materials. And in the world of food science, uh, the classical example is actually cornstarch. And finally, some materials uh, may need a finite stress to begin to flow. Uh, and at the end of that finite stress, uh, they may flow linearly uh, with the applied shear rate. Uh, so uh, the uh, stress that is needed to initiate flow is actually called the yield stress. And if the material behaves linearly, uh, then the flow behavior uh, is called a Bingham plastic or a viscoplastic. Uh, ketchup is an example of a material like this. Uh, tomato paste, peanut butter, there are many, many examples in the food world. So let's continue to observe uh, these materials. Uh, so in uh, shear thinning materials, as you increase the shear rate, uh, the structures that may exist in the material begin to align with one another. Uh, mayonnaise is an example of that. Uh, peanut butter is another example. Uh, and as these uh, uh, structures begin to align, uh, now the, the amount of uh, frictional resistance they create decreases. So we observe essentially that uh, non-Newtonian behavior. Now, uh, as I indicated earlier, some materials are uh, uh, shear thickening. Uh, and uh, uh, again, what that means is that the shear stress dramatically increases uh, under the applied uh, uh, shear strain rate. Uh, and uh, so uh, in equilibrium, the material actually can look like this suspension of particles. Uh, but as you apply shear, uh, the particles begin to aggregate and they form little clusters. Uh, and these clusters basically uh, produce the shear thinning behavior. Uh, but if the material is like starch and upon hydration uh, forms essentially a network, uh, then this network begins to produce some very high uh, resistance to deformation. Uh, and that's when we have shear thickening behavior. So I will show you a really quick, uh, I hope this is gonna work. Uh, I have a YouTube video here uh, to illustrate uh, uh, the behavior of starch. So let me try and play this really quick. I hope it's gonna come out here. Oh, I gotta move it. Uh, uh, are you guys able to see it because it moved from one no, it, it, we can't see. So I will move it here. So, so these kids are really excited. <laughs> I think they're really excited because they think that they are walking on water. Okay. So, uh, sorry, it's sort of like adjusting. Uh, but the point is that as the kid rapidly runs on the surface of this starch dispersion, he doesn't sink uh, because the material is shear thickening and it creates a large enough stress to actually carry the kid. Uh, but when the kid stops, then he actually sinks into the starch, essentially showing that when the shear rate is low, uh, then the resistance to deformation is very low. Uh, so, so this is, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, an example uh, 
uh, an illustration basically of what shear thickening really means. Uh, and now uh, let's see if I can get rid of this so I can go back to the presentation. Uh, it looks like I can. And uh, let's make sure that I'm not gonna mess this up. Okay. Oh, we are. Um, so the, the presentation is on, but for some reason, I'm not sure why it disappeared. Maybe oh, here it is. now we have it. Yeah, thank okay. you. Okay, so we have it back. Okay, so so that uh, you know this little video you know clearly illustrates what shear thickening behavior is, uh, and you know uh, why starch is a shear thickening material. So as I indicated, yield stresses are very very important. Uh, and uh, a simple indication of a yield stress is the fact that a material does not flow under the forces of gravity. For example, when you eat uh, uh, a pie, uh, the structure of the pie is designed in such a way uh, that it does not flow under the forces of gravity. So this pie has a finite yield stress. Uh, so does peanut butter. Uh, so does uh, ketchup, uh, so does tomato paste, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are many, many different materials uh, that have yield stress. So how do we typically uh, how do we typically obtain uh, yield stresses? So we can measure the shear stress at very, very low shear rates. We can do this with creep experiments by reducing the applied shear stress we can reach the point where the shear rate is super small and that vanishing shear stress becomes the yield stress. We can use models that contain uh, yield stress in them and we can try to fit the data with these models and that gives us a value of the yield stress. Uh, we can do stress relaxation experiment among others, uh, but one of the most common and most effective ways is actually to plot viscosity versus shear stress. And uh, as we approach the yield stress, viscosity tends to infinity. Uh, and the next slide will illustrate that. So for example, if we have uh, a, a, a Karaya gum uh, dispersion uh, and uh, we plot viscosity versus shear stress, uh, what we see essentially is that at some point, uh, the viscosity becomes larger and larger and larger, uh, but the stress is about the same. So the extrapolation of this viscosity to the shear, uh, to the shear uh, stress axis actually gives us the yield stress. The same thing with 3% karaya. This also will tend to uh, higher and higher viscosity values. If we come down and extrapolate this uh, uh, down to uh, uh, the, the shear stress value, we obtain the yield stress. So this is a material that displays yield stress, but some materials don't display yield stress. And guar gum, for example, in a, is an example of that. So in the case of guar gum, uh, as you uh, uh, decrease uh, uh, the, the shear rate corresponding to different shear stresses, what we see is that uh, this time we are tending to a constant viscosity as the shear stress diminishes, demonstrating that this material does not have a yield stress. Uh, so, so this is one of the best methods to actually uh, measure yield stress uh, uh, in your material. So another very important property is actually uh, the time dependent change uh, in the structure of the material. Uh, and in order to uh, get a picture of that time-dependent change, uh, we do what is called a thixotropic uh, loop. Uh, and the thixotropic loop uh, is uh, a loop where you increase the shear rate rapidly to a certain value, and then you bring it back down. And what you notice is that for a thixotropic material, uh, essentially, uh, you are not following the same curve on the way down. So on the way down, the material shows less resistance than on the way up. 
clearly the structure has uh, broken down uh, and therefore you have a thixotropic material. Uh, so on the other hand, you may also have a situation uh, where uh, for some materials, the reverse can happen. Now you go on the way up, uh, uh, on the way up and on the way down, the curve is actually higher than the curve on the way up. So the material actually thickens on the way down. Uh, and that basically uh, is a rheopectic fluid. Uh, and typically uh, shear thinning materials uh, come associated with thixotropy uh, and uh, uh, dilatant fluids come associated with rheopexy. Uh, and, uh, and one important uh, uh, concept to also remember is that if you let this material, for example, if you let a thixotropic material rest for half an hour or an hour, and you run a thixotropic, a thixotropic loop, you observe that the new loop will sit exactly on the old loop. That's the condition of thixotropy. If after half an hour, you run your thixotropic loop and the new loop does not sit exactly on the old loop, now you have a shear degrading material there is a permanent structural breakdown that has occurred in that material, which is different than thixotropy. <coughs> the same thing is, uh, uh, is a rheopectic fluid. Now, if you let the material rest, half an hour later, you should again obtain the exact same curve. Uh, if it doesn't, you have essentially permanent structure breakdown. What happened is that internally the structure has networked during the deformation uh, and essentially formed a uh, more shear thickening material. So let's move on. So now uh, there are a number of methods to uh, make measurements. Uh, the capillary rheometry is one of the commonly uh, used methods, uh, except uh, uh, especially if you have uh, quite thick materials like dough, uh, like tomato paste, uh, like some of the, uh, uh, like peanut butter. Uh, and in a capillary rheometer, uh, you typically put the material in a barrel uh, and you push it down with a plunger. Uh, and then the material flows out a very thin dye, which is called a capillary dye. Uh, and, uh, and now the force that you use to push the material with your plunger actually gives you the shear stress that you create in the capillary. Uh, and there, are, there is, of course, uh, there are mathematical equations to calculate that. But like I said, in this presentation, I will stay away from math so that I can emphasize concepts. Uh, at the same time, the speed with which the material comes out of, capillary, uh, of the capillary dye relates to the shear rate. So for a Newtonian material, I'll just throw uh, the shear rate is equal to eight times the velocity divided by the diameter of the capillary. So you have the shear stress, you have the shear rate, you plot them, you obtain your flow curve. You can also do your experiments, of course, in narrow gap rotational geometries. Many of you uh, must be familiar uh, with the concentric cylinder geometry, where you place the material between two concentric cylinders. And now you make one of them rotate. The internal one can rotate, and the external one can be stationary. Or uh, the external one can rotate, and the internal one can be stationary. Uh, and then the rotation speed is related to the shear rate and the torque to rotate the actual rotating piece uh, is related to the shear stress. So again, uh, you have calculations uh, to, cal to obtain the specific shear stress and the specific shear rate. You plot them, you obtain your flow curve. You can also use cone and plate geometries and you place uh, uh, you place your material between a cone that has a very tiny angle and, uh, and a plate. Uh, 
And one of the beautiful aspects of this geometry is the fact that the shear rate is identical at each location. Uh, but if you have particulate materials here, obviously you have particle to plate contact. So this geometry does not work well for particulate materials. On the other hand, you can now use the parallel plate geometry uh, if you have particulate materials. Uh, and in this geometry, uh, if the gap is considerably larger than particulates, you have no particle to plate con uh, uh, contact. Uh, and the resistance to deformation comes essentially from uh, the aggregate fluid. Uh, the only, uh, you know, the only issue with this geometry is the fact that uh, the shear rate changes as you move along the radial axis. So the shear rate in the middle is equal to zero, and the maximum shear rate is the one that happens at the rim, because the angular velocity is the maximum at the rim. So you need to make some corrections. But those corrections, as you know, are available uh, with the software that comes with uh, every piece of equipment. And in fact, nowadays, uh, rheology has been tremendously simplified for you by the manufacturers of equipment. They all have produced, generated, developed very nice software that actually does not necessitate that you even know the math. All you need to do is to know what you're doing, uh, that you understand basically how to run these experiments, uh, that you know how to make the corrections, uh, and you can obtain your flow curves. So an important aspect of making rheological measurements is to recognize that all these different geometries has, have to give you the exact same properties because the properties are the properties of the material they have nothing to do with the geometry. So if you take, for example, uh, you know, complicated materials to uh, whose properties uh, you want to measure, uh, like, the, uh, like tomato paste, like applesauce, uh, when you do measurements with three different geometries, they need to very nicely superimpose. Uh, and after considerable work, uh, my graduate students typically obtain these very nice curves where the data all superimposes, and that tells you that you have healthy measurements. So we're gonna move on. So, so far, we, we have only looked at the, at the viscous behavior of materials. So in simple shear, uh, the viscosity is equal to the ratio of shear stress to shear rate. But there is more that, that happens with viscoelastic material. Remember, we talked about the fact that uh, uh, when materials are viscoelastic, there is, a, uh, there is a normal force which pushes the material upward. Uh, and now those normal forces actually are manifested in rheometers uh, by forces that are pushing the upper plate. Uh, and there is a mechanism that keeps the plate in place, but measures the force necessary to keep the plate in phase, in place, I'm sorry. So that is called the normal force, the perpendicular force. So that perpendicular force produces another rheological property called the first normal stress coefficient, which is now the ratio of the normal force to the shear rate squared. Uh, and uh, there are since there are three dimensions, there is also a second component of the normal force, which produces the second normal stress coefficient. Uh, the nice thing about materials is that the second normal stress coefficient typically turns out to be very small. Hundreds and hundreds of materials have been tested. And the general thumb rule is that the second normal stress coefficient is uh, approximately maybe eight to 10% of the first normal stress coefficient. But nowadays, uh, the first normal stress coefficient is uh, easily measurable uh, with uh, most rheometers that are co uh, commercially available. And that becomes a very important uh, property of viscoelastic materials. So we're gonna continue. Uh, now there is again, uh, a lot of time dependence uh, in uh, uh, materials. So uh, you need to be aware of that. And you need to recognize that the time dependence is a very strong function uh, 
uh, of the applied shear rate. Uh, so in this particular curve, the y-axis is actually the ratio of the instantaneous normal stress divided by the equilibrium normal stress. So notice all the numbers here uh, are below one. At one, you reach the steady state normal force. Uh, but as you are in the process of reaching that uh, steady state normal force, you go essentially through a development process. And that development is uh, very slow at very low shear rates, but uh, becomes progressively higher as you increase the, uh, the, the shear rate. So this is an example of no stress development for butter at 25 degrees centigrade. Now, when you take the data at equilibrium uh, and you plot the primary normal stress coefficient versus shear rate, you obtain essentially on log log coordinates, you obtain these straight lines. And here you can see data for uh, the squares are for ketchup, uh, the, uh, the diamonds are for mayonnaise. So this, this, this is ketchup, uh, this is mayonnaise, uh, this is margarine, uh, and the circles are apple butter. Uh, and again, stick butter, canned frosting, mustard, etc. So you can see all of them uh, display normal forces, uh, and all of them display shear rate dependent uh, normal forces. So we move on. Uh, we just talked about uh, shear uh, measurements. Uh, now we're going to talk about uh, extensional measurements. So extensional measurements are very important, as I indicated, during dose shearing. Uh, uh, CO2 induced bubble growth, et cetera, et cetera. We talked about uniaxial uh, extension, biaxial extension. So we're going to move on. Uh, so, you know, a way to represent extension flows is to look at a simple cube. Uh, when you create an extent, uh, a uniaxial extension, uh, the cube basically extends. It's like grabbing a chewing gum on two ends and uh, pulling it. Uh, and uh, what you see is essentially uh, that uh, the uh, material becomes thinner in the direction in which you extend it. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, it becomes longer in the direction in which you extend it, and it becomes thinner in the directions in which uh, uh, you actually, uh, which are perpendicular to the direction that you extend it. Uh, we've seen how biaxial extension is essentially the creation of more surface area. So you have this initial cube. Uh, and by increasing the, the area, you actually uh, produce uh, this uh, final uh, rectangular material, uh, but its thickness becomes, of course, uh, smaller. Uh, and finally, planar extensional behavior is the behavior where uh, you put essentially a restriction on extension in one direction, and this material extends in the form of a plane. So it's essentially like uniaxial extension, but it's extension in two directions. So there are ways in which you can measure uniaxial extension flow. So in this particular example, uh, the material is uh, uh, attached to two ends uh, of uh, areometer where the head rapidly, uh, uh, rapidly moves up. So you look at the extensional behavior. Uh, and again, you measure the force. Uh, you measure the extensional deformation rate. And this piece of equipment is actually available commercially uh, by Thermo Fisher, and it's called the MARS. Uh, you know, we talked about biaxial extension flow. Uh, you can grab essentially uh, a TXT2 texture analyzer. You can lubricate the two surfaces like here, uh, and you can have lubricated squeezing, and that produces uh, uh, biaxial extension flow. Uh, and uh, it turns out that. Uh, uh, for materials that are Newtonian, these properties are quite related. Uh, but what we observe is that the resistance uh, in extension is always much larger uh, than in shear. For example, the uniaxial extension viscosity is equal to three times the shear viscosity. The planar extension viscosity is equal to four times the shear viscosity, and the biaxial extension viscosity is six times. Uh, the uh, steady shear viscosity. And for non-Newtonian materials, actually this constant can become larger and larger. And uh, for dough, for example, we have measured it to be uh, 24 in some cases. 
So we move on, and now we're going to look at, uh, uh, you know, characterization of viscoelastic uh, properties of materials in different kinds of measurements. Uh, so the easiest way to uh, to picture uh, viscoelasticity uh, is actually to imagine that you have tennis balls and you are bouncing them on the floor. When the tennis balls are fresh, they are completely elastic and they come back to your hand. But if you, leave, if you let them sit like a month and you try bouncing them, suddenly some of the air has disappeared. They're no longer uh, as elastic as they used to be. So you bounce them, they don't come back. So there's actually some viscous dissipation in the material. There is some elastic uh, component of the deformation behavior, uh, but there's also some viscosity uh, because the ball essentially doesn't bounce as high as it used to bounce. So uh, examples in the food world are many. Again, you know, ice cream, chewing gum, dough, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, almost, uh, I would say 95% of food materials are viscoelastic in nature. Uh, and we need to know something about viscoelasticity in order to be able to uh, uh, properly understand the properties of food materials. So again, viscoelastic materials have both viscous and elastic properties. Viscous properties, as we have seen, are typically probed at long deformation times. Uh, we have seen, uh, for example, uh, the increase in normal forces as a function of time. So the final, final equilibrium uh, situation where the properties converge uh, is where now all the forces, the transient forces have disappeared. Uh, and we are now looking at, uh, uh, you know, some of the non-transient behavior. So viscous properties are probed at long deformation times. But elastic properties are probed at very short times. Uh, you know, when we have a piece of jello uh, and we bounce on it, it immediately recovers. Uh, it happens in a fraction of a second. So that elastic properties is manifested itself uh, essentially in less than a second. So in order to be able to characterize these properties, we have three different experiments. This exp the first experiment is called stress relaxation. The second one is called creep, and the third one is called the uh, small amplitude oscillatory measurement. In stress relaxation, we apply a constant sudden, de sudden deformation, and we look at stress. In creep, we do the reverse. We apply a, a constant stress, and we measure deformation. And in small amplitude oscillatory measurement, we apply a sinusoidal strain, and we look at the sinusoidal stress. So uh, I think uh, right now, because time is very limited, I will skip this slide and the next one. Uh, instead, I will just go to the typical behavior in a stress relaxation experiment. So again, this time we are plotting uh, the behavior of the deformation at time t is equal to zero. Uh, we have a sharp increase in the deformation and stays constant. An ideal fluid will show a rapid increase in stress and then that stress will drop down to zero. An ideal solid will jump up to the equilibrium stress, uh, but will stay there essentially for the duration of the experiment. A viscoelastic fluid, on the other hand, uh, will give you this time-dependent change in stress. And if it's a liquid-like material, if it's a liquid and it has uh, elasticity in it, uh, it basically uh, will show this curved line, but it will equilibrate down to zero. If it's a solid, it will again show this curved line, but it will not equilibrate at zero, it will equilibrate at a finite time. Uh, so these are, these are stress relaxation experiments. Uh, and the important property to measure during a, a, a stress relaxation experiment is the stress uh, relaxation modulus. Uh, which is the ratio of the time-dependent stress that we are measuring to the initial applied strain. Uh, and again, for a hooking material, the, the uh, relaxation modulus is constant uh, and stays there as a function of time. Uh, for a viscoelastic fluid uh, solid, it will drop, but it will never reach zero. And for a viscoelastic liquid, it will start from a high value and it will drop down to zero. So 
Uh, a very important part of these experiments is actually to do them in the linear region. And linearity means that the properties of the material, for example, in this particular case, the relaxation modulus uh, is not a function of the applied deformation. So imagine that all these curves are sitting one on top of the other. Uh, you know, I, we couldn't make them sit one on top of the other uh, because they would not be visible. But imagine that they all are uh, sitting exactly one on top of the other. So for this particular material, strains up to uh, a value of uh, gamma four gives us the linear region. Above this strain, uh, the relaxation modulus does not superimpose anymore with the uh, relaxation moduli at small strains. So now we are in the nonlinear region. So in order to be able to obtain uh, linear viscoelastic uh, outcomes, one has to do the measurements in the linear region. Very critical to remember that. Now, there is also a very, uh, an, an enormous amount of molecular information that comes uh, during these measurements. Uh, so this is the typical behavior of a dilute solution. Uh, it turns out that you can relate the relaxation modulus uh, you know, to uh, uh, the molecular weight, to entanglements, and so on and so forth. And there is some math that goes with it. But like I said, in this particular presentation, I'm not going to worry about the math. Uh, if we have essentially polymeric liquids, and polymeric liquids in the world of food could be uh, starch, it could be gums, it could be proteins, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if the molecular weight increases, then uh, the relaxation curve moves up. Uh, so essentially, the higher the molecular weight, uh, the, the larger the relaxation curve. And finally, you know, if you have uh, cross links uh, and the material behaves like a gel, uh, now the relaxation modulus remains constant. And the more the, the cross linking, obviously, the material becomes stiffer. And that is reflected in the magnitude of the relaxation modulus, which becomes larger and larger. And remember, the relaxation modulus is the time-dependent stress divided by the input constant strain. So important to remember all of this. And this is an example with, uh, with soft dough. Uh, and uh, you can see basically uh, what happens to the relaxation modulus as a function of uh, moisture. You know, at the smallest moisture, we get the largest relaxation modulus. And as we increase the amount of moisture, the relaxation modulus drops. Uh, so the, the relaxation modulus is very sensitive uh, to ingredients within the material. Uh, and also, it turns out that uh, uh, if you know the, the uh, amount of the particular polymer that you are focusing on, uh, there are ways in which you can superimpose the data. Uh, here you see, again, the relaxation, uh, the relaxation modulus is a function of time. Uh, and they all superimpose, uh, even though we have three different proteins, because essentially we've used the superposition principle. So let's move on really quick to uh, uh, a creep experiment. The creep experiment is one when we show, when we apply a constant stress. So for an ideal fluid, we have large deformations. A solid, again, gives us a constant uh, uh, strain uh, at that applied constant stress. And the viscoelastic material will grow to some extent. And if you remove the stress, uh, then the material will actually uh, regain its uh, part of its strain. So this is called the recoverable strain. Uh, and it, this time, uh, Opposite to what we saw earlier, for a fluid, the material doesn't come to zero strain because some of the energy has been dissipated. Uh, but for a solid, the material comes back down to uh, the uh, zero, uh, zero uh, original uh, deformation. Again, it's important to make the measurements uh, at, in the linear region. So you test a different small stresses to see where they superimpose. Uh, and uh, at some point, you reach a stress where the data does not superimpose. So you need to do the measurements in the linear region where the data superimposes. And again, just like the, uh, the stress relaxation data, uh, 
in, in creep, this time we create a rheological property which is called the creep compliance. And we are taking the ratio of the time dependent deformation to the applied uh, stress. Uh, and this is called the creep compliance. And we plot typically the creep compliance as a function of time. Now, because this is a marker of fluidity and not solid-like behavior, the more liquid-like the material behaves, the more the, the creep compliance grows. So for a dilute solution, the creep compliance rapidly grows. Uh, for uh, polymeric liquids, uh, the smaller the molecular weight, the more liquid-like the material is. Uh, and then the larger the molecular weight, essentially the creep uh, compliance grows more slowly. And when we have a cross-link polymer, uh, essentially again, there is very, uh, there's a very slow increase uh, in the creep compliance. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, the value is the smallest compared to all the other phases like a dilute solution or a polymeric liquid. So this is ex uh, these are essentially uh, creep curves for uh, bread making dough. Uh, and we show the behavior at different applied stresses. Uh, so it is uh, fairly low stress. Uh, you can see that the, uh, the, the creep compliance uh, essentially increases, uh, uh, you know, fairly slowly compared to the other applied stresses which are much higher and make the material more liquid like. And finally, you know, the part of the uh, stress that doesn't completely, uh, the strain that doesn't completely go down to zero is called the recoverable strain and is a measure of the elastic behavior. So this is an example with, uh, uh, with emulsions. Uh, here we have uh, uh, emulsions that basically contain egg yolk uh, and therefore are more stable and more solid like. Uh, and here we have emulsions basically uh, that don't contain egg yolk uh, and also don't contain any salt. So you can see that uh, the creep compliance rapidly increases because they are very liquid-like, whereas here the creep compliance uh, uh, increases more slowly. Uh, and the number on each curve is actually uh, the storage time. Uh, we see in the presence of egg yolk, the, the, the emulsions are much more stable uh, compared to the liquid-like uh, emulsions. Uh, so creep, uh, creep measurements are a very sensitive type rheological measurement uh, to apply, uh, especially for materials that are not that stable like emulsions. You know, it looks like I have exhausted uh, my time and I want to allow for a little bit of time, uh, you know, to answer questions. Uh, you know, there is one other type of uh, uh, measurement that I would have liked to discuss with you, uh, but uh, I will actually uh, leave it on the screen so that the video captures it. Uh, you know, this is small amplitude oscillatory measurements, and when stress and strain are in phase and the phase angle is equal to zero, we have a solid-like material. Uh, when the phase angle is at 90 degrees, we have a liquid-like Newtonian material. And when the phase angle is between zero and 90 degrees, we have a viscoelastic material. So I will leave it at this. Thank you all for attending the webinar. Uh, and uh, I will be happy to answer a few questions in the time that we have. Uh, Viridinia, I cannot hear you. Got it. Sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Gokini, for sharing your knowledge with us. It was a very interesting presentation. I think it has a lot of in, uh, uh, very useful information, general information, but very useful um, depending on the experiments that we are planning and that we want to, uh, of the, the analysis that we want to apply. So for now, let's start with the question and answer section of this webinar. Uh, remember to turn on your microphone if you want to ask the question directly to the speaker, or if you don't want to do that, I, uh, you can write it um, down in the chat and I can read it um, for you. Questions? 
Well, I, I do have one, if, um, if you don't mind. I, I would like you, Dr. Cucchini, to, I mean, we, we know that the, the applications uh, for the industry, uh, this, this rheology and these um, concepts, but I want you to talk to us about maybe one or two particular um, applications with the industry or for example with NASA, like what, what are you applying, uh, how, how do you apply this science to, 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 your, um, to your projects, science projects? Okay, so uh, uh, first of all, let's share some, uh, you know, common uh, uh, examples. Uh, we know that food materials uh, change during storage. Uh, you can use uh, any of the measurements, the viscoelastic measurements that I showed you, uh, to actually capture uh, the, the degree of change during storage. So some materials are stable, relatively stable. Some materials are relatively unstable. Uh, when they are stable, the rheological properties remain fairly constant during storage. When they are unstable, they dramatically uh, change in the direction of becoming liquid-like. We have seen that in the case of stress relaxation, that means that the uh, relaxation modulus becomes smaller and smaller. In the case of creep experiments, the reverse happens because the creep experiments are about fluidity and the creep compliance dramatically grows as the material becomes more unstable. And in the case of uh, small amplitude oscillatory measurements, essentially we move from low phase angles to much higher phase angles. That's one example related to storage. So if I can give you another example, you know, we work, for example, on trying to uh, uh, understand the impact of mixing on the formation of bubbles in dough. Uh, and mixing is a very complex operation that involves both shear flows and extension flows. So we discussed uh, shear flows earlier in the, the, in the webinar and extension flows uh, later on. It turns out that uh, the formation of bubbles is very sensitive to the magnitude of extension flows that are created. So the more, the more, uh, the larger the extension field, the smaller the bubbles, and that's what you want in order to actually have a bread that has a uniform distribution of bubbles. So that's another classical example, and we published, for example, uh, uh, maybe uh, a couple of dozen papers in this particular area. Uh, and you can predict uh, the size of the bubble once you begin to develop an understanding of the flow field during mixing. Thank you. I have one question uh, from Maria Fernanda Gonzalez. Well, actually two questions. The first one would be, what is the food with the most complex rheological properties, maybe that you have observed? And the cost of this um, kind of rheological analysis. The equipment, in other words, the. Uh, what I, is, I think that the cost, I don't know if of the analysis and perhaps of the equipment, rheometers. Okay, so if you want to buy the equipment, uh, typically, uh, you know, it depends on what company you approach. Uh, but I would say nowadays you should be able to buy uh, a pretty good rheometer right around $50,000. Uh, now, it, it all depends on, you know, uh, how sophisticated you want the rheometer to be and whether you want to do measurements under pressure, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, if you want a lot of sensitivity. But $50,000 will get you a very decent rheometer, especially if you can, if you know how to use a, a stress uh, controlled rheometer. Stress controlled rheometers uh, have become very popular in the food industry. Uh, 
because they are low cost, they are very flexible, and you can do very good measurements. So what was the other question? What is the most complex material that I ever encountered? Yes, the, the most complex, yeah, food with the, the food with the most complex rheological properties. I would say that uh, there are uh, many, many foods with very complex rheological properties. You know, uh, I would say that uh, dough is one of the most uh, uh, interesting materials, uh, very complex. Uh, I would say materials that actually uh, are uh, like suspensions, tomato paste, uh, are very complex to obtain good measurements uh, because there is essentially phase separation that occurs when you make measurements and you need to make corrections, non-stop corrections. In fact, you know, in just a few minutes, I will have a student come in to talk to me about how you can make those slip corrections, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, you know, all the foods, uh, uh, I would say some candies are quite complex in nature. Uh, and the more components you have in the food uh, and the more body and structure the food material has, uh, the more complex uh, it becomes. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, from, well, I have one question from Brady. It says, hey, Dr. Gugini, thank you for the presentation. You mentioned 95% of foods are viscoelastic. So which food types, like examples, are not viscoelastic? Okay. So, I mean, let's start with the, with the simplest uh, food material that we uh, use like six, 10 times a day, and that's water, right? Water is Newtonian. Uh, many of the sugar-based materials, you know, like honey, uh, like, uh, you know, syrups, uh, like molasses, uh, drinks, uh, are all Newtonian uh, in nature, uh, and they are fairly simple, very simple rheologically. Uh, but, you know, uh, the world of dilute liquid-like materials and uh, sugar loaded materials are the ones that actually produce uh, the uh, simplest rheological properties. So if the molecular weight of your ingredient is very tiny, then it tends to behave uh, as a Newtonian material, even if you load it. Uh, like if you take a sugar solution that contains 40% uh, sugar, it still remains Newtonian because it's a very small molecule. Sugar is a very small molecule. So you get essentially that Newtonian behavior. Okay. Um, so Mauricio Perez is asking, are there any possibilities of changing the rheological properties of food? He is talking about treatments or maybe substances. Absolutely. I mean, foods are very sensitive uh, to thermal treatments. Uh, the viscosity is a very strong function of temperature. You know, we did not talk about that today because I just wanted to introduce the basics of viscoelasticity. We can have you later again. Okay. <laughs> I'd be more than happy to give you a follow-up presentation. Uh, so the, uh, uh, in particular, you know, when you work with uh, uh, molecules that are, that can be chemically very active, like proteins or carbohydrates. Uh, the interactions between the molecules uh, generate very different uh, rheological properties. Uh, adding, for example, small amounts of uh, either starch or small amounts of gum uh, into, a, uh, into a solution will thicken it dramatically. It will make it non-Newtonian. It may add yield stress. Uh, if you heat proteins, you may end up forming cross-links, disulfide bonds. Uh, and therefore, you know, you would now form gels uh, uh, and you would form uh, uh, yield stress generating structures. So yes, I mean, rheological properties are, of foods are very sensitive to almost uh, anything that you do to them. Um. Rodrigo Cantelan asks, 
Aerogel is a material by NASA used to build things in the ISS. Uh, it is based on the structure of gels. With this structure, you can make really light products that have a great um, heat capacity. Do you think there's another structure that can be taken from any fluid in order to produce something else with the same applications? Yeah, I mean, we, we have been working uh, on uh, aerogels made of uh, Zane gels. Uh, and, uh, you know, in our world, we actually make gels uh, that have a wide variety of uh, uh, encapsulation properties. Uh, we do them by adding, uh, you know, small amounts of nanomaterials in them, uh, by processing them in very unique ways. Uh, you know, there is a, there is a good place, uh, in my opinion, in the food world in terms of uh, uh, enriching the structure of food materials with, let's say, all sorts of bioactive uh, compounds uh, that would induce health promotion, health promoting properties uh, when aerogels are used. Yes, that's, those are very interesting materials. Thank you for asking that question. Um, and I want to thank everybody else for asking their questions. And we have plenty of questions. I told you we have we normally have a great audience. Um, so I, I'll I'll cut in two more questions just because of your time too. Um, Carlos Ceballos wants to ask it um, the question aloud. So Carlos, if you can turn on your microphone. Yes, sir, I'm listening. Uh, Carlos Ceballos. Okay, so I'll, I'll skip to the other. Oh, there, there you have. Carlos? Can you hear me? Yes, sure, we can. I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Now, I would like to, to, to thank Professor because your presentation was uh, uh, amazing. And now, um, for this question, I need to briefly put you into context. I'm currently using a kind of nozzle which has a static meter inside. And any fluid that I use for uh, pass through the nozzle has to have certain properties. In particular, it had, it, should be able to behave like a laminar um, fluid and, uh, and it should be Newtonian. So before I um, make my tests, I need to, to analyze any fluid I am going to use. Uh, in this particular case, which of the analysis you have uh, shown us should be uh, suitable in order to to, to understand the rheology of the fluid in order to, to fulfill the requirements that I have mentioned before. Okay. So you said that, uh, you know, the material needs to be Newtonian. Yeah. So in, or, in order to uh, show that the material is Newtonian, I would use the parallel plate geometry, uh, assuming the material is not too dilute, too liquidy. It's not like water. You know, if it has a little bit of thickness to it, I would use the uh, parallel plate geometry and I would measure shear stress as a function of shear rate. So I would plot shear stress versus shear rate. Uh, and hopefully what you will get is a straight line when you plot shear stress versus shear rate. And the slope of that line will give you the viscosity. And you will also prove that the material is Newtonian. So if you have, the, if you have a flat line that doesn't curve up or doesn't curve down, uh, you will actually have demonstrated that you have a Newtonian material. OK. Is that, is that helpful? Yes, Professor. And any of the other analysis would be useful or just with the one you have mentioned? Yeah, I think you can also use, uh, I would say you can easily use uh, uh, the cone and plate geometry, you know, if you don't have any particulates and if you want a Newtonian material, uh, 
uh, typically you get that without particulates anyway. Uh, you can use the, uh, the concentric cylinder geometry and you do the same thing in all three geometries. You measure shear stress versus shear rate and you prove that you have a straight line uh, and that basically shows that you have a Newtonian material. And in a particular case, if I want to know if I have a laminar flow inside the, the nozzle, uh, some of these, these tests would be useful in order to know if the uh, uh, fluid is, become, is behaving like in the laminar stretching? Yes, so as you know, uh, laminar flow is defined by the Reynolds number, uh, which is equal to uh, uh, dv uh, rho over mu, uh, meaning uh, the diameter, the velocity, uh, and the density divided by the viscosity. So you calculate the Reynolds number, and uh, if the Reynolds number is equal to uh, uh, is equal to or less than 2100, uh, you actually have laminar flow in your system. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the farther away you are from 2100, uh, you know, the more guaranteed you are to be in the, uh, in the laminar flow region. Thank you, Professor. You're very welcome. Um, I Dr. apologize. Dr. I have to, you know, I have to move on. I have somebody yes. waiting for me outside. Um, I, I'm, I'm, if you, if you can share your email with the audience so that they can email you the questions, is that okay with you? That would be perfectly okay. So uh, my email is my first initial J, my last name K O K I N I, at Purdue. P U R D U E dot E D U. If you didn't get it, you can also email me um, so that I can I can share right. with you Dr. Bikini's information. And well, thank you again, Doc, um, Dr. Bikini, for this um, talk. Thank you all for your participation. It was a great audience today. We we reached almost sixty um, participants. Well, please keep tuned and check our website and our Facebook page for more information regarding to our next month's presentation. Dr. Kakini, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye. 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 Ciao. Hmm.